Hi, I'm John Gowins, organist and choir director at St. Paul's Episcopal Church in Laporte. This is going to be an informal, but I hope informative, uh, explanation, demonstration of the pipe organ at St. Paul's Church, including uh, looking around the inside of the instrument as well. Now, I'm going to start with some very basic thing here. A pipe organ is normally divided into divisions. You have a section of the instrument that's played by a particular keyboard, and I'm going to show you that first. As you know, we have two keyboards or manuals, and I'm going to show you what those are about. And that chorus of sound was actually reinforcing natural harmonics that happen in the sound. If you don't understand that, no worries. I'll just kind of quickly show you what's going on. You had your basic unison sound, the main pitch that you're hearing. And a set of pipes playing an octave higher. And two octaves higher. So it adds up working together as one sound. And we have something called a mixture, which gives you not only different octaves, but also fifths. You can just hear it by itself here. So that's the chorus. And medieval organs, you couldn't separate that. You, you played a note and many pipes came out giving you a complete chorus. So what, when controls were added where you could shut those off, those were stopping the sound. And so the sort of peculiar terminology came into use, at least in English-speaking countries, of calling these controls stops. It's different in each language. But uh, that's the tradition in English. So when I talk about different stops, I'm talking about these controls that are engaging sets of pipes. Also, something I should explain, we can bring together the resources of the organ by something called couplers. For example, these push buttons you see underneath the swell keyboard couple the swell down to the grate. So when I press a note on the grate, it pulls down the keys of the swell. Here's without, whoops, some stops on there. And we can couple from either the swell or the grate down to the pedal. So I will demonstrate that. Let me turn this where you can sort of see it. The couplers for the pedal are worked by knobs down here. So this is the pedal division by itself. Now we'll couple the swell down. Now we'll add coupling the grate. Okay. Now we're going to do a tour inside the instrument, but I thought you needed to have that sort of basic geography of the instrument first. The swell is enclosed in a box with shutters, which I will show you, and we operate that with a pedal. And here I will show you that. Now you can look through and see it. And we use that to get dynamic nuances and also to get crescendo getting louder gradually or decrescendo getting softer. And of course we have the pedals and those have their own stops also. Now let's try that again. And 
And if you're wondering, am I playing notes with my feet all the time? Yes, pretty much. Now, uh, something else that you may be noticing here is a couple of foot controls. Now, what these do is they act on the stops in the grate. One of them shuts off all but the quietest stops. So if I have all of this going and I press the pedal to the left, that shuts it off more of the, most of the louder stops. The one to the right brings on all of the lower stops. The stops up here were later additions, so they're not brought on, the ones at the top here. But everything else comes on. Although, to get it to come the whole way on, I have to give it a pretty swift push. So that's acting on the grate as a quick way to add and remove stops. But most of the changes I do, I do by hand. Uh, a word is in order about just what this term stops means. On organs of the medieval period, they often had sets of pipes at several different pitches that worked together as a chorus. Now, right above the console where I'm playing is the great division and the pipes on the facade, all but the two on the far ends speak and the pipes right behind them, all of those are part of the grate. You saw earlier the shutters opening and closing in the swell. The swell is behind the grate. The pedal division actually speaks into the transept. You can see a few things here. The sort of silvery pipes right behind the altar, that was one of the sets of pipes added in 1978. That is the violoncello. The large brown wooden pipes you see are the Borden. That's the only stop that was in the pedal division originally. From this view also you can see the open shutters of the swell division. Now we'll take a better look at all of this shortly, but I thought it was good to get an overall view of just where everything is. Now here we are looking inside the chamber. You can see the swell pedal to the left and you're seeing the back ends of the pedals and you can see where the mechanical, let's see if I can get us out of the shadows here, where the mechanical connections are made. You have basically a metal hook wrapped with some kind of string or wire connecting onto a wood piece. We usually refer to that as a tracker. The whole action on this organ is what is known as a tracker action. So it's all mechanical key connections. So when you press on a pedal, that pulls, that, that pulls on this wood piece and there's sort of a rocker there that takes the movement over to another location. Now let's try to show you some of that in action here. Now that's actually where the coupler connects in. The stops for the pedal are trackers running along the floor. show you the other side of that soon, but I'm going to take this in the order that we encounter things as we walk through the chamber. Okay, you saw the stop knobs. The stops are actually acting on sliders here, and when the stop is drawn, the slider is aligned so that the holes at the top of the chest will let air into the pipes when you play the notes. So when you're stopping them from sounding, 
you're moving the slider to close off the air to that particular set of pipes. You can see the facade pipes from the back side here. So we are looking now at the great division. Now, let's look at that swell. We can see this a little better here. So open and closed. Now, the blower isn't where you can see it. It's all contained in this little box. That's to keep it quiet. Here you see what looks like a big bellows, and it's kind of like a big bellows. This is, oops, sorry. This is the reservoir. When the blower is turned on, air pressure pushes the top of this up, and that engages something called a curtain valve. So once the desired pressure is met, it stops trying to push more air through the instrument. As I play, and as there's demand for wind, the top of this comes down a little bit. It's fighting me to do that, but uh, so as air is needed, that opens the valve a little and lets more air through. Now from here you can see actually some of the key action from the pedals and you see the trackers running away from us here. That's where the pedal division is. We're now facing toward the transept from inside the chamber. This is the tremolo. Organs have had these for centuries. A tremolo is a device which intentionally makes the wind pressure fluctuate at a reasonably steady speed. That's worked by a stop knob. I will engage it so you can see it in action. So air is puffing out right here, off and on. So the valve is opening and closing. That's making the air pressure fluctuate. Now, I don't usually want it to beat this fast, so I have to play some special tricks with it. Like partially drawing the stop to slow down the pressure that's going into it. Now, I suspect that my predecessor, maybe several of my predecessors, maybe didn't use the tremolo very much. I was using it early on, and an interesting thing happened. You see this flexible air hose. When I was using that, the air hose came loose. So suddenly we had a bunch of air pressure leaking from within the organ. When the servicemen came to look at it, we found it was something that simple. The hose had just come undone, so we cemented it up there. Now I'm going to try to record this in super slow motion, so maybe we can see what's going on a little better. Now I'm still in about the same place, basically underneath the swell. And now we are looking at the key action from the great division. So you can see where, from little rockers there, the movement down, well, wait a minute. Anyway, movement of the keys, there are a couple of rockers these go through to change the movement from up to down as needed. But what happens by the time you get here is that the trackers are going down to pull on a pallet, sorry, that pull on a pallet that opens the note. So all the pipes of a particular note are lined up and the pallet beneath it opens up that note and the position of the sliders determines which stops are actually playing when you do that. Now, here you see some more trackers and some more rockers. This is the key action for the swell. Now, these little parts you see here, these are called roller boards. Sometimes where the tracker comes up isn't far enough over to get to the note you need, so the roller board 
takes that movement let's see here see here we have a low note and the tracker is coming up way over there but it needs to be on this end of the chest so the roller board is simply moving that to a different position horizontally and then the connection continues up here are some more rockers for changing a in this case a sideways movement to a downward movement so throughout all the movement for the stop controls, for the tremolo, and for the key action is all done by trackers with these rockers and roller boards, whatever we need to get things to the right position. Now we are still under the swell division. Here you see a wood wind trunk with a leather joint connecting a couple of pieces. The wind pressure is directed up to the chest through these wood wind trunks. And here you see the stop action for the swell. So the rods coming back from the console go through rockers here that change them into sideways movements. And here are the levers going up to act on the sliders in the swell. Now I'm standing next to the pedal division. Here you can see some of the connections going to the stop action for the pedals. I'm standing on a walk board, but the, you can see the rockers and the trackers. And coming toward me here, those are the trackers connecting directly to the key action under the pedal chest. Now originally this organ was smaller as installed in 1872 and more than a hundred years later 1978 the instrument was restored and some things were added but they were added in a clever way the original wind chest and actions were all still here but you see a little extension right here this business was sort of grafted onto the existing chest and that's carrying some wind and here, here's the tow board where some sets of pipes were added and you can see the back end of the sliders here so he was able without disturbing the original structure to add a few stops on the same was done on the swell you can see this lighter wood is where a couple of small sets of pipes were added. Those are high pitch stops. Now for the pedal, he added three stops and there was only one original. So that probably is an all new chest. Would have to be, because there's no other way they could have accommodated that. we have two basic types of pipe, the flue and the reed. The flue pipe works like a recorder, such as you might have played in school. Air pressure comes up through the toe at the bottom of the pipe, and when it reaches the mouth of the pipe, you have the lower lip right where my thumb is, and you can see above that a, a flat piece called the languid. Between the languid and that lower lip, the air is formed into a sheet, and when that strikes this upper lip, it goes out and in and out and in, and that's where the vibration starts for creating the pitch. You can get a variety of sounds this way, depending on the diameter of the pipe relative to its length, and what is done with the end of the pipe. Is it open? Is it closed? Is it something in between? And also, the material of the pipe can make a difference. The material of the pipe is made from, that is. Okay, now a reed works, well, the simplest explanation is, works like a clarinet. When a clarinet is played, you have a mouthpiece with a little wood strip that vibrates. Here it's brass. So we have 
at the bottom here, you can see a little thin strip of brass and that tube that it's lying on top of, that's like the mouthpiece of the clarinet. That's the shallot. And then the reed, you can see it protruding up off the top of the shallot. That vibrates as air passes over it. Then this copper wire you see here controls how much of the reed actually is free to vibrate. That's used to adjust tuning and sometimes volume. In this organ, we have three reeds. The trumpet, and the pipe I'm holding here is from the trumpet, the oboe in the swell, and in the pedal, the cremona. More about those a little bit later. We are still in the great division, so let me show you a few things. You see the facade pipes from the back. Fortunately, they're much prettier from the front, thanks to some church volunteers restoring stencils that they discovered traces of when the organ was worked on in 1978. The higher range of that set of pipes is near the front. That is the open diapason. The diapason is your basic principal sound in the organ. Just behind that is the dulciana, which is thinner, a little more, sort of a softer diapason, but leaning a little more toward a string sound. These wood pipes, these are open wood pipes in a special flute sound called the melodia. This was very popular in American organs from the mid 19th century up until maybe about 1930 sort of disappeared from use after that. Then we have the four foot principal, the chimney flute, the two foot fifteenth, and here's the trumpet, and here are the stops that were added in 1978. Well, this set of two, two sets of pipes here is the so-called cornet, then on this section, we had a two-rank mixture, that is two sets of pipes per note, to which around the wall in 1978 added two more, but you can switch those on and off, and I'll demonstrate that later. Now, many American organs have what some might call the shortcut, where some of the stops lack the bottom octave of notes, so you have something called a stopped diapason bass, and those are the wood pipes you see with the handles on the top. There are actually stoppers there, uh, which enables you to get a lower pitch with half as long a pipe. So it's an economy move, but again, common in organs of this period. So I'll draw that along with any of several other stops that I might draw. Notice here also the chimney flute. You can see these little tubes sticking out of the top of the pipes here. So that's another kind of flute, and I will demonstrate all of these. Now, interestingly, you do various things to tune these. The melodia, you can see these flaps, which you can move around to change the effective length just slightly. You can see some pipes have slots cut out of them, sort of like opening a sardine can with the key uh, to vary the length. But an another quite old way of doing this is what's called cone tuning, where you basically you tap the uh, top of the pipe with a cone to make the pipe flare out or in. Here's one that's tuned flaring out slightly Here's one that flares in, and that was done with a cone. Now, as you might imagine, that can be tough on the pipe, so once they're tuned in well, you basically leave them alone if they're cone tuned. Sometimes that cone tuning is quite visible on some of these smaller pipes, too. So we're looking mostly at the mixture, and the taller two, two sets of pipes here 
are the ones original to the organ. Now we're looking inside the swell. And I will do my best to explain what we have here. At the back, I can't get very close to it. You have to have to take some of those shutters off to get in and there's no walk board. So I don't even try to do that. But the back set of pipes there is an open, open diapason. In front of that, those really skinny pipes with the slots cut just part way down, not cut near the top. That is called the carolophone. That's a very thin, light, delicate, stringy sound. Okay, then we have the stopped diapason. And here, the stopped diapason covers the whole range of the organ. So you can see the stoppers with the wood handles and, of course, wood pipes. In front of that is the walled flute. Now, this is a particularly pretty sound. I'm going to try to get in close because there's a special effect here. You can see little holes. Maybe I should pull a pipe out so you can look at it. Bear with me a moment. Right there by my thumb, there's a hole pierced in it. And what that does is it makes that pipe skip what pitch it would give out at its length normally and jump up to the next harmonic, which is the same thing in a sense that a flute player does playing an orchestral flute. Therefore, this set of pipes creates a pretty convincing orchestral flute sound. This is called the walled flute, which simply means wooden flute, but Another term for this kind of design would be harmonic flute, and it is indeed a lovely sound, and I make a point to use it a lot when I'm playing here. Here we have the oboe. So that's a reed. You can see the wires for controlling the reed length, but you'll notice, unlike the trumpet, which was just tapered straight up and down, with the oboe, it's got a, a more slender part, and then it bells out more at a certain point, point. Another piece is connected here. And you can see where a little cone tuning has been done on this as well. Now here on the end, grafted onto it, are two high pitch stops. These were added by Ronald Wall. Again, I think it's quite clever how he did it, because he managed to squeeze this in, in rather tight space, in a way that really didn't disturb the basic uh, instrument that was already here. So if somebody wants to be a purist about it, you can quite easily not use the stops that were added. And it still sounds, well, it, it, it sounds nice. It sounds pretty much as it originally did. I don't try to do that much because a lot of the stuff that was added was quite useful. Now I mentioned the stop diapason bass in the grate which was a shared set of pipes for the bottom octave of several stops. We have the same thing in the swell, and that's what you're looking at with the stoppers. The oboe has a separate stop called the bassoon, which is really just a continuation of the oboe, just for the bottom 12 notes, but you can draw them separately. I'm not sure what the practical value of that was. There may have been some repertoire for which it was useful to have a different setting at that breakpoint. But the bottom 12 notes, the bottom octave, I draw separately on this organ. Okay, here we see part of the stop action for the pedal. And here's the wind trunk going from the side of the reservoir up to the chest for the grate. Here we are looking at the gems horn. You can see how the pipes are tapered. They're narrower at the top. These are positioned, this is part of the pedal. And to one side here, so to the right as I'm looking at it is the back of the Borden 
To the other side is the back of the Cremona stop. So the Gems horn is kind of stashed away in a tight little spot there, but it's a useful addition to the organ. That again dates from 1978. So the violoncello, that's the transept facade, the Gems horn, and the Cremona were all added to the pedal in 1978.